We thank you, Lord, that we can come and we can read your word. And as we read it, our God, we just ask that you will open our eyes and open our hearts and our minds to your word. But we pray, our God, that we might not just be hearers of your word, but we might apply what we listen to this morning and what we learn into our own lives. We ask these things in his precious name. Amen. If you've been coming on, on a Sunday morning, uh, you will know that we are following uh, a subject which is on the prayers of Paul. And uh, this morning, there is, the question is this, how much are we committed to praying for one another? Now, I remember some time ago, a number of years ago, hearing a story about a lady who was disabled, unable to, to go to church, unable to be involved in the activities of the church, but she kept herself connected. Uh, uh, and what she did, she, she had a box on, she sat in a chair and she had a box on either side of her chair. And the pastor went to see her one day and he was curious as to why there was a box on each side of her chair, thinking, well, when he asked her the question, well, what do you, what do you keep in the boxes? I expected her to say something like, well, I keep my spectacles in this one, and I keep my changer in that one, and I keep my newspaper, but she didn't. She said, what I do is this, she says, when I learn something about somebody in church, or I hear something about maybe one of my relatives, or maybe one of my friends, or one of my neighbors, she says, I take a card, and I write their name on it, and then I write the details on it. And then I pray about it, and I put it in the left-hand box. And she said, I'll take another card out, there's one there, and I'll look at that, and I'll update it, and I'll pray about them. And then I'll transfer it over into the right-hand box. So the pastor said, well, what happens when there's no cards in the left-hand box? She said, oh, that's easy, I just take them to the right-hand box, put them back to the left-hand box. She said, I go to bed, she says, and when I, I can't sleep, she says, because, you know, she's a I can't sleep much these days. She says, I put them on both sides of my bed and I take the card out. And if I can't sleep, I just sit there and update it and pray for them. And, um, you know, she said, uh, that's, what I, that's what I do. Now, I'm going to come back to that story a bit later on in, in the message. But I heard a few years ago about a, a man, um, he, he, he had been a, a believer all his life, as it were, and he, He'd done many things for the Lord, and he was, uh, he, he died. And at his funeral, his son was there, and his son listened to these people coming up and telling the, the people who gathered for the funeral just what, the dad had been, what his dad had been doing throughout his life. And he listened to the message that was given, and he'd become a believer. He committed his life to the Lord just through what he'd heard about what his father had done in his lifetime. And again, I'm going to come back to that story as well. I'm sorry I'm going to keep you in suspense about what I'm coming back for. But to get this, this particular chapter that, that, that Anne has read to us, and in particular, we, we, we're really going to look at the prayer at, at the end of the chapter, but I, I just want to just sort of get it into its context, as it were, the, the, this, this, uh, the book of Thessalonians and these letters that, that Paul wrote. If you remember, Paul, on his second missionary journey, he reaches a place called Troas, and a couple of times he tells us that the Spirit of God had prevented him from going where he was planning to go. I think he was planning to go into Bithynia. But instead of that, the Holy Spirit uh, has prevented him from doing that. And he has a vision at Troas of a man standing and saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Macedonia is in, in Greece, as you probably know. So they left Troas, they went down to Philippi. You may remember what happens to them at Philippi. Paul and Silas are put into prison. There's a, an earthquake uh, and, and the prison doors are opened. In the end, the, 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 the jailer uh, becomes a Christian and eventually they, they, they leave Philippi and the next place they go down to is Thessalonica. And Thessalonica uh, was a main city in Macedonia. It's still a city there. It was a prosperous city. It was politically prosperous and commercially prosperous 
And although it enjoyed the goodwill of Rome, it wasn't uh, subject to the, the Roman taxation that other places were. They could mint their own coins, I'm told. And they didn't have to have, they weren't obliged to have a garrison for the Roman troops in, this, in the city walls. And the population was made up of people, obviously, who were born in Thessalonica uh, and those around the district. There were some Romans who, who came and lived there and they became wealthy uh, people and they were benefactors in that place. And there was some Jews there. And there was enough number of Jews there to, for a synagogue to be there. And as was the custom, uh, when Paul arrived, uh, he went on, on three uh, occasions in, 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 uh, together uh, into the synagogue and he preached to them Jesus. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 17. And in Acts chapter 17, it tells us that some of the Jews who, were, who listened were persuaded and they joined Paul and Silas along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. But if you continue to read in, in Acts chapter 17, you'll read this. Some of the Jews were jealous. And they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. And if you know what happens there, the, 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 with the mob go to find Paul and Silas at the house of Jason where they were staying and when they couldn't find Paul and Silas there they took Jason by force along with a number of other believers that were there and they took them to the town council and the mob accused Paul and Silas of causing trouble all over the world and accused them of treason against Caesar because he'd been speaking about Jesus the Messiah and it was to him that homage was to be paid. And of course they, they, they said, no, well that was treason. But the town council made Jason and the other believers pay a bond. And when they got back to where Paul and Silas were, they were they, in fear of what might happen to Paul and Silas, the believers there sent them away uh, to Berea. But Paul, in this earliest, earlier part of this letter, you will see that he, he expresses uh, that he has this deep longing in his heart that he wants to go back to visit them again. He says this, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while. And then Paul and Silas and Timothy, they were only there for three weeks. But Paul adds this, he says, Although we were separated from you for a little while, he says, though our hearts never left you. Now I know over the past years, since, well, since the beginning of 2020, we're coming up now for the uh, three-year uh, uh, remembrance, if you like. We know, you know that I'm sure that there was a deep longing in your hearts as there was in ours, um, to, be, to meet people face to face, and we couldn't. You couldn't meet family. You couldn't meet anybody, really, uh, at all. You had to stay away because of the pandemic. Anne's already reminded, she's taken, taken the words. She hasn't seen my notes, but I think she's been having a sneaky preview of it. There was no technology in those days. No such things as Zoom. I mean, I think we got to know Zoom. I think Zoom, I don't know what, what Zoom used to mean to us, but suddenly this Zoom came in and we were able to see each other on the screens, as we do now on a, on a Tuesday. But there was no Zoom, no iPhones, no emails, no texts, no WhatsApp, Facebook, no other methods of communicating as we have today. And when Paul's short visit, his three-week visit, was over. He hadn't been able to teach this newly planted young in the faith church more about the Lord Jesus. And he, he hadn't had time to, to teach them how to have their faith strong in the face of opposition. In, in fact, he, he probably didn't have enough time even to appoint spiritual leaders before he had to leave hurriedly. And he leaves them to, to face the the troubles and the persecution 
that their newly found faith was already bringing them. And Paul had already warned them, if you, you remember when we read in the scriptures there, he'd already warned them that this would happen to him, to them. But Paul has a passionate love for these Thessalonian believers. He's got a, a burning desire in his heart that he, he wants to see them again. Paul wanted to know if through all of the persecution that they were going through, that he already knew was going on, had their faith stood firm in the midst of the troubles and the sufferings? Was their faith growing or had they just given up? Had they returned back to their idols? You know, the, it, it tells us, doesn't it, the, in the first chapter of this letter, it says they had turned to serve that turn from idols to serve the living and the true God. And Paul, he just wanted to know, had their work amongst them been a failure? You know, when children or, or, or someone else who's close to you, when they leave home and they, they go off, maybe if it's a children, maybe go off to university or they might go off into the, into the forces, as I did when I was young, uh, perhaps they, went, they, go, they go on a mission or they go backpacking holiday somewhere abroad or they go to work in another part of the UK or, or, or they go around the world somewhere to work or to stay. You want to hear news from them, don't you? You want to hear how they are getting on and when that news doesn't come as quickly as you thought it was, you begin to worry, worry about it. But you know, sadly, some people just walk out. They walk out of their families, walk out of their homes, go missing. Thankfully, not all of them that go missing end up being found dead. But you, see, you can see just how much longing there is in the lives of, of those people that they've left behind. As their husbands tell them how their wives have walked out or their wives, how their husbands are, Maybe it's a child that's walked out. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's just a relative. Maybe it's just a friend. But you can see, as they tell their story, just how much they long to see them again. Or maybe just to, just to hear their voice again on the telephone. Or perhaps, if they don't want to be reunited, maybe with their family and their friends, just to know that they're safe and they're well, and they're doing okay. Paul had a deep longing in his heart for these Thessalonian believers. He had a deep burden for them. And Paul waits, and he waits, and he waits to be able to return to them. And I know the scriptures will tell you that uh, he's prevented. We're not going to go into that because I don't, I don't understand why he wasn't uh, why he was prevented uh, from going there. We don't know the full reasons. But nevertheless, he could wait no longer. And he sends Timothy to them. And then he has another anxious wait, doesn't he? Because Timothy's got to travel from, I believe it was Athens he was travelling from, up to Thessalonica, and then find out what was, what was happening up there. And then to travel all the way back. We don't know how long that actually took. But when Paul comes, when, when Timothy comes back, Paul is overjoyed at the good news that he brings back about these Thessalonian believers. He's so overjoyed, as we've seen from the verses that Anne read to us, and, and especially in these last few verses of 9 to 13, his prayer. He's so overjoyed that the Thessalonian believers haven't forgotten Paul's visit. And they have as deep a longing in their hearts as he has in his heart to be able to see each other again. And Paul's greatly encouraged by this good news that's brought back by Timothy. He's overjoyed. His worst fears have been taken away. Paul learns that they've not only remain strong in their faith but their faith and their love has been growing and it's a great boost to Paul it's, it's like it's like new life courses through his veins as it were that despite all that they have suffered 
All that the Thessalonian believers have suffered, they're standing firm in the Lord. And Paul just bursts into this praise and thanksgiving prayer. And when you consider it, you know, Paul was already himself suffering a lot, even in Athens. And yet he's almost saying, well, even though we are suffering here, now we're really living. Despite all of this constant hardship that we are also going through. In, in fact, when you, when you look at these words that, that Paul writes, you get the sense that Paul just can't find adequate words to tell God how thankful he is. His, his words of thanks seem to be not enough. And I think we see something almost that seems outrageous. Because as Paul thanks God for what he has done, what God has done, he asks God to do even more. And Paul tells them just how committed he was to pray for them. That they, that they were praying night and day. That doesn't mean that he didn't go to sleep, by the way. Or he didn't go to work. It just means this, that Paul is saying, we've never, ever given up praying for you. We are so committed to praying for you and asking God concerning, concerning you. We have not stopped. We have not ceased praying. And Paul had been asking God that he would make it possible for a minute to to be able to return to these Thessalonians again. But Paul is reminding them that it must be God's will. He says, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. And it's almost God is saying, not yet, Paul. It's, it's not the right time. But if you, if you go on reading uh, and you read about Paul's third missionary journey... Uh, it's considered by most that God makes it possible for Paul again to go and visit these believers, these Thessalonian believers, maybe even more than once if you, if you look at the, the journey that, that Paul takes. Paul, you know, at the beginning of this letter, he, 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 he acknowledges the, the fact of the, uh, that, uh, that these Thessalonians had loving, they were doing loving deeds. And you know, when you take a cup and you turn the tap on and the cup gets full, you turn it off. But if you don't turn it off, what happens? Well, the water spills over, doesn't it? It spills over. Growth is what Paul was desiring of these Thessalonian believers. But I believe that Paul takes it a step further. Not only does he pray that their love will grow, but that it will overflow as does our love overflows, writes Paul. Paul's desire is that the Lord would keep on increasing the Thessalonians' love. But not just for their fellow believers, not just for those that were around them, but for all, including the lost, to spill over the top for all people. That's how he wants their love to grow. And then Paul prays, May he, as a result, may God, as a result, a result of what? Well, that takes us back to that verse again, where the prayer of Paul is that the Lord will make their love grow and overflow, and as a result, that the Lord will make their hearts strong. Or perhaps we could put this another way, that he, that he will make their hearts to be established or to be stable. Naturally, our hearts are not established. Our hearts are not stable. There's no natural holiness in us. And it can't be said that anyone is blameless. But Paul strongly desires that God would establish the Thessalonians' hearts blameless in holiness at the return of Jesus with all his saints. Paul didn't pray that they would be sinless but blameless. Or if you want to put it another way, he's, uh, of being free of all valid accusations when they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at his return. You might remember, if you were here last week, uh, Phil remind us, reminded us that uh, some churches emphasize constantly the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
been there, got the T-shirt. We used to belong to a brethren church as well. And there are churches like that who put a lot of emphasis on it. But in some churches, you won't hear it at all. You won't even hear it being mentioned. Isn't this our hope? Is it? Is it yours? Do you really believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again? You know, Paul, at the end of each of the chapters in this first letter to the Thessalonian believers, he mentions something about the Lord's return. Now, I'm going to just stop just there because I know somebody will come and probably say to me, ah, but you know, when the scriptures were written, they weren't written in chapters and verses and things. No, they weren't. I'll agree with you. But please, just go with me this morning on this one. This is what we have, and this is what I want to say. In the end of chapter 1, Paul says something, or I say he mentions something in every chapter about the Lord's return of this, in this first letter. In chapter 1 and verse 10 he says, And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. In chapter 2 and the end verses there he says, After all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus, when he returns, it is you, yes, you are our pride and joy. In the end of chapter 3, as we've read, may he, as a result, make your heart strong or established or stable, blameless, free of all valid accusations, and holy as you stand before God our Father, when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. Now in chapter 4, he, 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 a lot of that chapter is dealing with a question about the believers who had already died and about those believers who would possibly die before the Lord came back. What would happen? Would they miss out? No, says Paul. And that's where he gives the answer there. And he deals with that in, in chapter 4 towards the back end of it. And he tells them, how the Lord is coming back. And in the end of chapter 5, he says this, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. So that's just a little aside. Uh, because the question this morning is this, how committed are we pray praying for one another? Now I'll come back to those two stories. The lady, who, as you remember, I told you about, who was disabled, couldn't get out to church and what she was doing. That lady knew the real meaning of commitment to praying for others. And she knew the value and the power of prayer. And over the many years, though, she, she might have never, ever known just how many of those prayers were ever answered. But she had the assurance of this. God heard every one of those prayers. Remember about the son I told you about? Go back to that story. About his father's funeral, how he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his own saviour. His father never had the joy this side of heaven of knowing that that prayer was being answered. But I believe that that man's father joined with the angels in heaven over one sinner who repented. And one day... Yes, the Father and the Son, will be, they will be reunited, either at the return of the Lord or when his Son is called home to, to be with the Lord. One day, too, that lady will meet many of those people that she faithfully committed to praying for. Personally, I'll always be thankful uh, for the people who prayed for me People who prayed for, for, for my salvation. I didn't know the Lord until I was 23 years of age. That's when I committed my life to the, to the Lord. And I'll always be thankful 
for those people who prayed for me continually that the Lord would provide, the Lord would protect, the Lord would strengthen me from my childhood right up until the time when I gave my life uh, to the Lord. But you know, other people con committed to praying uh, beyond that. They kept praying for us uh, after uh, we were saved, after we, we were married uh, for, for both of us. And um, I know that, that, you know, we could not have done the things that we've done in our lives had those people not continued to committing to praying. And I'm sure that even today, I know there are people today who continually pray for us. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'll always be thankful for the people who pray. We learn from Paul to pray. We learn from Paul to commit to prayer. And we see often in, in, in Paul's writings, don't we, how he urges believers to pray for one another and also with one another. To be committed to pray, not only for ourselves, but for believers. Uh, sorry, for our, not only for ourselves, but also for believers, our brothers and sisters, and also for those who are non-believers. For all people, says Paul. Pray for all people. Prayer is vital to our everyday lives as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praying for others doesn't necessarily mean that we know the person or we've ever met that person. I know personally, I probably spend more time asking God than thanking him. And I wonder if you feel like that this morning yourselves. I always, we're always asking God to do things and not spending enough time thanking him for what he's already done and what he's doing right now and what he will do in the days that lie ahead, God willing. And I wonder sometimes, how many times have we said to someone, I'll pray for you. And we've gone away and we've prayed. Then we've forgotten to pray for them. Now that situation in their lives. Do we pray night and day as Paul uh, tells us, tells these believers? Maybe a quick prayer here, a quick prayer there. Maybe I've been awake in the night, not been able to sleep and not finding a reason why. And maybe, yes, I've spent some time praying, but not not always. What about the quiet times that we have each day? Or at least I hope you do anyway. Uh, we, quite, we term them as quiet times, don't we? Read the Bible, go through a passage, maybe think about it, uh, maybe follow some Bible study notes, uh, say a little prayer, and then what? Now, I don't want you to go away from the service this morning thinking, did Eric Reeves telling me that uh, it's wrong to have interests in other things, uh, to be passionately interested in them? I'm not. I was just listening just this week to a, a lady who was being interviewed. Somebody, she, she, I think she was part of the film that had been made. And she said, you know, she said, this film lasts for three hours. She said, people sit there for three hours and watch this film. They don't even take time to go to the toilet, she says. They sit there and they watch this film for three hours. They don't want to miss anything of the action. They don't want to miss anything of the storylines. I wonder if sometimes how long we spend following what we passionately are interested in for longer maybe than three hours. And we're happy to be engaged in those things. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong in that. Please don't, don't go away saying, Eric Reeve says it's wrong to passionately follow some kind. No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. When we think about that, when it comes to praying, are we willing to have that same kind of passion, that same kind of interest in praying. And I think we have to ask ourselves there, what is the priority? How much passion, how much commitment have we got 
to praying for one another and for all people? And that's the question, isn't it? It's only one that you can answer. It's only one that I can answer. It's the one that challenges me. You know, we live in a, a, a quite a, a, a free country, don't we, really? We not, don't have the um, same kinds of uh, persecution that we, we read of that in other places that they have. And maybe we become a little bit complacent. I know during this last week that we, um, the, the, the theme was about injustice. Um, and uh, in, there was many times in the, in the course of the week uh, we prayed about the persecuted church as well and the injustices that they face along with many other people as well around the world who face injustices for other various reasons. And this morning, that's what we've been thinking about, haven't we, really? This is the Thessalonica, Thessalonica church is a persecuted church in Paul's day. I was reading just recently um, about a report that's been done on the Christians in China. And they're uh, facing severe persecution and troublings and sufferings day in and day out. And it's reported that the two in five Christians face persecution in Asia today. And the situation in China is amongst one of the worst countries for persecution. Um, Leo would tell you this, that uh, China is 16th on the worldwide watch list. But the report said much to the encouragement of the Chinese believers uh, and those who are committed to praying for them and also supporting them. This is what the report said. It said, China has witnessed a religious revival over the past decades, in particular, with a significant increase in Christian believers. The number of Christians has grown by an average of 10% annually since 1979. And by some estimates, some people have estimated this out, that China is on track to have the world's largest population of Christians by 2030. Seven years down the line. At present, there are 96.7 million Christians in China and it's growing every day. Of course, when you look at the population of China, that's only 7% of China's population of 1.4 billion. China is supposedly has the, the largest population, but I understand that India is very, very rapidly catching up with them. This young in the faith church at Thessalonica knew from day one of that, that, that they would have troubles, they would have suffering, they would have persecution, as also Paul did, and those who were associated with traveling around with Paul from place to place. And though they suffered, yet they grew. And as they grew, they grew stronger, despite the persecution. Just a little aside there, but the question, as I say, is how much are we committed to praying for one another?